want to say this morning is a great morning to worship God. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made, the Bible says, which means that we were created for something very special today. And um, so if you're here this morning, when you're standing up here, your faces are dark, which could be a good or a bad thing, <laughs> depending on if you're frowning or smiling. But I want to say welcome this morning specifically to our physical church that have come this morning. We really appreciate you. You are very important to us. And I know there are people in Pretoria and some other places that just can't always physically come. So we also want to include them on our online, uh, this morning, our online service. Welcome to you. You are very blessed this morning. We are blessed to have you this morning. And I know there are people that watch our service later on. They don't maybe watch it live. So I want to include you this morning and say a special welcome to you this morning. And know that, you know, wherever you are watching it from and whenever, always remember that God never does something for nothing. God always has an expectation in your life and he wants a return. And God's always ready to give us something. So when we come this morning, I want you to say, Lord, I'm receiving from you this morning what you've got for me. Can you do that this morning? Maybe you, you can comment if you're watching online or just yeah, say to the Lord, wherever you're seated this morning, Lord, I'm expecting something today. Can you do that? Now, uh, your faces may be dark, but your voices aren't dark. You can, I can hear you. <laughs> so you can say it to me this morning. Lord, we're expecting something this morning. Amen. Yes. So, so because you confess that, something is going to happen this morning. Now, if you were with us last week, if you were not, uh, the good news is you can catch it on our YouTube channel. Pastor Wayne kicked off our series on, I think it was called Routine and Rhythm. And you can go watch. If you did it, it was great. He spoke about that the Word of God is a lamp to our feet, and it's also a light. And he had a light in his hand which can shine forth and show us the way. So if you didn't catch that uh, series this morning, the launch of that series, I want to ask you to go and watch it. It will be an encouragement to you on our YouTube channel. But this morning, I am live here, not on the YouTube channel. So you can watch me live this morning if you see it yeah. And I'm going to be continuing that series on routines and rhythms. Now, you may be thinking, how can that help me this morning? And it's a good question. How can that help you this morning when we speak about routines and rhythms and how that's even in the Bible, you may say, Jack. How can that be even the Bible? It is in the Bible, and it can help you. All you need to do is hear this morning. And so I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to start with how these two uh, actually work together. How do routines and rhythms work together? Uh, I'm speaking just in the natural, sir, and then I'm going to go and show you how it works in the spiritual. Are you happy with that? Now, let's just, who's ever watched some good ballroom dancing, or it doesn't have to be ballroom dancing, but dancing that's technical, and it just, have you ever watched it and said, oh, I wish I could dance like that, it made me, you know, I can't dance, but I just felt like getting up, because, you know, those people, they just, they just like float through the air, and they move in sync, have you watched them before, and you just want to clap, you know, you're not even there, but you want to clap, because they're doing so well. You know why that uh, if you watch great uh, dancing, whatever it may be that's technical, do you know why they excite you so? It's because they've got rhythm. Isn't that right? They just flow together. They're not one. They're two, or normally two people. And, and, and it just seems like, you know, they were born like that. Not true. Not true. They may have been born with a little bit of rhythm, but let me tell you, that rhythm takes a lot of routine. Now, routine comes when you have to wake up in the morning, you don't feel like it, and you have to do steps, and you have to do toe exercises, and you have to lift your leg, and, and try to understand ballet probably, and you have to do it over and over and over, every boring moment of the day. You know why? Because when you get together and you want to dance that routine, you want them to see only one thing. You don't want them to see routine. You want them to see rhythm. Because what excites people is not routine, it's rhythm. You say, those people have got rhythm. But let me tell you, behind the scene, they've been practicing their little booties off. They have been practicing their toenails off. They are really tired 
but they know for them to have a great rhythm or flow, whatever you want to call it, they need a very strict routine. Now, let me be a little bit more for those who, those are for the ladies now, the dancing. Let's get to the men. I want to give you an example of how routine and rhythm works together. You know, have you ever watched these crazy skateboard people? Have you watched them? I mean, they do half pipes, no pipes, full pipes. But, you know, whatever, they, they travel through the air. They try and go through a railing when they're bored. It's absolutely crazy. And, you know, when you see them get it right and they land that trick and they land that thing and, and they put music to it and you just, they defy gravity where they go in and then they touch their board and they do a flip and you think, that's, that's not real, that's trick. Those are tricks. No, they are tricks, but let me just tell you. Now, when you watch them and they land everything, they've got such, you say, wow, that guy's good, eh? He's got such rhythm. Boy, he was born with talent. Yes, he was. But let me tell you what made him great was routine. When he wakes up in the morning, he says, I'm going to go to the skate park and I'm going to go practice this flip and I'm going to go practice this half pipe and I'm going to practice this eye-defying uh, trick. And let me tell you, you what you don't see is the broken arm and the dislocated shoulder, and all the skin off his legs and knees, because for every trick he's landed, he's had a hundred times where he's failed. And he's gone through that routine over and over, because he knows the more he practices, the more he has a routine of how to balance the moment he, he gets into the air, how to position himself, the more rhythm he seems to have. So, if you want to be a good skateboard, uh, uh, skateboarder, you have to know that if you don't, aren't willing to practice something over and over, you will never have rhythm. Yes, you, you can make people laugh. America's got funniest videos in South Africa and everybody. You can go and watch them there, but it's not rhythm. It's just land and crash. Boom. I prefer those ones. But it's something about watching people that are good, that excites you, that says, gee, I'm inspired by that person. Because they've done that. So that's how rhythm and routine fit in, in the natural. So you understand it now. So if you want some rhythm, you need some routine. And which one is the more exciting? <laughs> I think the rhythm is the most exciting. People clap for the rhythm, the routine. They say, I don't want routine because it's boring. It's monotonous. It's the same thing, Jack over and over, and I sometimes even get hurt in the process and cry by myself because nobody's there to see it. they clapping when I do it right. Nobody knows that I, I broke my arm and I uh, got all the skin off my knee. Nobody knows that, but that's how it works. So I thought this morning, how can we get this natural phenomena into our spiritual lives as Christians? I think you. Are, I know you're thinking. Like I hope he gets spiritual and tells us how can we have some routines and rhythm so that when people see us, they say, "Wow, how did you get there?" Well, there's a process, and I'm going to show you the process. We all were born <coughs> to have rhythm. I want you to say, "We all were born to have rhythm." If you've got two left feet, there's a reason for it. You haven't acknowledged your right one yet. But it's coming. So, I want to start with the first routine that I have learned personally of how to find rhythm in my spiritual life. And I want to share it with you in a very practical way, if I may, do that this morning. And uh, so, the first one I want to share, the first routine that produces rhythm. Now, we're going to get to rhythm. Just remember, we're going through the boring stuff first. We're going through the monotonous stuff. We're going through, ah, the stuff that hurts. But let me tell you, this is the most exciting stuff. When I share it with you, you're going to say, forget about the rhythm. We love the routine. Are you ready? So let's start with the first routine. The first routine that I find helps me to find rhythm in my life is a routine called, are you ready? This is mind-boggling. This is going to blow your socks off your feet. So hold on to your shoes. Otherwise, your shoes are also going to be blown off your feet. Now, the first one is prayer. Ah, prayer. Now, let me make it easy for people that just cringe right there. Prayer is very simple. Prayer is talking to God. 
Not about God, talking to God. So I want to use an example to show you something. When you were younger, and maybe some of you can remember it, maybe it's a long, distant memory, but when you were younger, you had a best friend. Who, who can remember a best friend? Okay, don't put up your hand. We don't want to embarrass anybody here, because maybe you didn't have a best friend. But you knew people that had best friends, and then they would go to school. So how do best friends start a relationship? Please tell me. Were they born best friends? Uh, did somebody say, you and you, will Jack, you and Pete will be best friends? And that's it. No, no, no. Best friends start because somehow you have an affinity to somebody and you like them. And so you start to do what? What's the first thing you do to create the friendship? You talk to somebody. And so you get excited. Now, best friends are like this. I'll give you a scenario. They wake up in the morning. They don't want to eat their breakfast because all they can think about is their best friend is at school. And so even before they get to school, if you're living today, you're texting, you're Instagramming, you're messaging. Ah, I can't wait to see you. I'm telling you, I've got a lot of things to tell you. This is going to be a great day. You and I are going to have great fun. Is that right? Best friend. And then you go to school and then you have to go to class. You say, okay, I'll see you at break. Then at break, you take your Samis or whatever your mother put in or apple and you say, you share your food with your best friend and you talk about stuff that you want to do, stuff you're interested in, stuff that happened, stuff that nobody knows about you. You talk to your best friend. Is that right? And then you say, oh, we have to go to class again, but you know, I'll see you at the next break. And the same thing happens. Then you go home and before, while you're walking home, you're texting your best friend. Listen, I've just gone past a tree. Uh, not that it's significant. And, you know, there was a car that rode past me here. And because that's what people text because they've got nothing to say. And, you know, um, I can see my house in the distance. And your best friend says, shut up now. Go home so I can miss you. But what happens is that's what best friends do. Then they start all over again the next day. And even while, before they go to sleep, I just want to tell you, you're my best, my best friend. Now, listen to the story. Something happens at school, and all of a sudden, the best friends, they're still in the same school, they still have the same friends, they still uh, go to class, but now something strange has happened in their routine. No longer are they talking to one another, they just on a meet and greet basis, like this. No longer after break are they rushing to say, or at break, we need to talk about what's going to happen next week and our future vacation and what we're going to do when we finish school. No, no longer is there any intimacy in talking to each other. And then somebody comes and says to me, I'm that person, what happened to your best friend? Why aren't you best friends anymore? Something happened, isn't it? Have you seen people do that? They stop talking to each other, and because of that, their relationship drifts apart. All the other things that incorporate a relationship is affected by when you stop talking to each other. Now, imagine when we do that to God. Imagine when he was our best friend, we couldn't wait to walk, wake up in the morning and tell him all about our day. We couldn't wait at break to share with him what the silly teacher thought about us and what they want us to do. We couldn't wait to complain about our mother's food. We couldn't, whatever we told Jesus, we couldn't wait. And then one day, we stopped talking to Jesus. We stopped praying. That's what we stop doing. We cut out of our routine prayer. Because in essence, prayer is talking to Jesus. Can I ask you to say that? Because sometimes prayer sounds so holy. Can I say prayer starts by talking to Jesus? Thank you. So prayer starts by talking to Jesus. So the first routine in my life is talking to Jesus. It gives me rhythm. It's coming. But it's the beginning of rhythm. The second thing I want to talk to you, because I don't want to share too long, but I've actually got three points, so don't worry, that was the first one. But the second one is the longest one, So uh, uh, because it's, it has so many things. Now, um, 
I'm going to read you a scripture because you thought I wasn't going to be, use the Bible. I am. Uh, Psalm 23. Who's read Psalm 23 ever? Most of you. All right. If you are watching and you haven't le- read Psalm 23, go and read it. It is worthwhile. It is worth the read. As a matter of fact, most of the Bible is worth the read, but Psalm 23 is special. Now, I want to cut off the first verse because it's not what I'm sharing on. I want to go to the second part of the second verse. So if I skip something, it's just because I'm getting to the point. Are you happy with that? So Psalm 23 verse 2, the second part says, He leads me beside still waters. Now, I'm coming to the, what is the second routine that's important in my relationship as far as getting rhythm with God? The second point is, He leads me beside still water. Now, if I say, I am leading you, what does that imply? Can anybody tell me? Because that is what the second point is. If I say, I'm leading you, and you're following me, what does it imply by, just by, it's it's not a trick question. What what does it mean? Anybody want to guess? Anybody at home want to guess? Thank you for that hand. I see it. But I can't hear your answer. But there are people here. What What is the answer? What's your guess? God's leading me. What what am I doing with God? What am I doing with God? What am I doing with God? I'm walking with Him. I'm walking with God. He's leading me, and I'm walking with Him. Isn't that interesting? Now, do you know that you can walk with God and He can be 500 meters ahead or 500 meters behind or 500 to my left and right, and technically, I'm still walking with God. Is that right? He's just 500 meters away. But what I'm talking about is what the scripture says, and I'm going to just read you that scripture quickly, and they'll put it up there. Galatians 5 verse 25, since we live in the spirit, let us also keep in in step with the spirit. Who's ever watched um, a platoon of, of people that are walking in step? Anybody ever been watched army, been to the army, seen these people marching? You find that they're doing what? Where are they? They're walking together, aren't they? And they ha- they're in sync. You, they, have they got a rhythm? Yes, they've got a rhythm. You know why? Because behind the scenes, uh, they aren't asked nicely. They are forced to practice marching. And if they don't, they get punished. So they learn to march. Even if their one fe- foot is not in sync, they say, you better get in sync every foot. And you're marching. So what does that platoon, when you see them, do they look like they're going in the same direction? Yes. Do they look like they're in step? Yes. Now, have you seen people that children are there and the, and the father's watching and he said, you know, my son's the only one in that platoon that's in step. <laughs> the, whole, the whole bunch of the other people, they're out of step <laughs> because that one child is out of step. And as a parent, you say, well, my child's the only one in step. But have you seen, you can see a guy from a mile out, which is out of step, out of step with God. If we, one of the routines that I want to encourage you is stay in step with God. Why? Because he's going somewhere and he wants you where? Right next to him. Why? Because God is leading me somewhere. Say God is leading me somewhere. And I need to walk with him. I need to practice the routine to stay in step. Who's ever seen, now don't go and do this. Who's ever seen the t-shirt with a hat like this? I'm with stupid. <laughs> you know, if you have that, uh, if you have that T-shirt, don't wear it. If you are the recipient of that T-shirt, don't walk with that person. <laughs> I think spiritually, you can wear that T-shirt if you believe that you're walking with the devil. Then it's technically correct. I'm with stupid. But I, I would like to design my own T-shirt. I haven't seen it yet. With the hand going like this. I'm with God. I'm not stupid. I'm with God. We are walking in step, and anybody looking from far off can say, that person has got a routine which is giving him a rhythm with God because he is walking with God. Now, let's just see where this leads now. So where is God leading me? The Bible says, he leadeth me beside still waters. Isn't that great? Now, How many of you have been in a house with children shouting, your wife shouting, your your neighbor shouting, the dog shouting, and you say, God, this can't be still waters. 
It's hectic. Anybody ever, like Pastor Brad would say, it's hectic. Would, does anybody ever have that feeling where everything is like chaos? And you say, God, lead me beside still waters. Now, I have to tell you that I grew up in Freyd, a small town. And outside, I don't know if it still exists, but for many years, there was a place called Stillwater Motel. <laughs> I still remember it. When I was reading that, I think about Stillwater Motel. Now, Stillwater Motel uh, was not still because it served a lot of stuff. It caused people to be rowdy. But it had a great name, Stillwater Motel. Still water. And I think God leads us to still water. Why would he lead me to still water in a routine? Why do you think? Because I need it. Since your life is chaotic and follow me, I'm going to lead you to still water. And it says, what happens at still water? Verse 3 says, exactly what still water happens at still water. He restores my, my soul. What was troubled by all the chaos and the noise? My soul. The being in me, it was chaos. And God says, you know what you need to do? Follow me. Let's go in step to still waters. Not still water motel. Still waters where I'm going to restore your soul. Wow. There is rhythm right there. He restores my soul. I'm so glad you're excited about that. Yes, he restores my soul. Now, I'm getting there. I'm, getting, I'm starting to get rhythm now because I was all messed up. And God says, follow me. I'm going to lead you to still waters. And then it says, I restore your soul. And then he says, he leadeth me because I'm in step with him. I'm walking with God. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Do you know what that means? Instead of going down, paths are going to lead me in a circle and paths are going to get me off a cliff and paths that have got snares for me and paths that have got lions are going to kill me. God says, I'm going to lead you through a path of right standing, something that I have mapped out for you. Where's that, Lord? Follow me. Walk with me. I'm going to lead you down that path. Now, we know that when we were young, Many people led us through the, down the garden path. And that's an expression that means it wasn't a great path for me, maybe for them. But I landed up on my face. I landed up with egg in my face. And so God doesn't do that for me. He says, I'm going to lead you, Jack, through a path of righteousness. It's going to be a great path for you. You want to find a great path? Then get into the routine of being led by God and the Spirit and stay in step and walk with God. Amen. Now comes the scary part. Put on your scary faces because here is a scary verse. And verse 4 says, yay. And uh, you, and that's just interpretation for ya, yeah, you. Yay. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, what on earth? The valley of the shadow of death. Who wants to walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Now, David is writing this as an experience he's had. So he, he's, not, he's not faking it. He's, he's telling you a story about his life. But who wants to go through the valley of the shadow of death? I don't want to because you know what's there? Scary things. People that want to come and, and taunt me. You know what happens in the valley of the shadow of death? Bad things. Now, why would God lead me into the valley of the shadow of death? Why should I even care? You know why I should care? Because I'm walking with God, guess who's right next to me in the scary valley of the shadow of death? God, where is he? 500 meters ahead. No, he's right there saying, Jack, follow my lead. Follow my left foot. Follow my right foot. But God, there are scary things around me. He says, I understand. But remember, I am the one that's walking with you. And because you, I'm walking with you, you should be confident. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. It's who's with you. <laughs> God is with you. Heaven is with you. The power of, 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 of heaven is right there at your disposal. So, then the psalmist says, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because, <laughs> why do I fear no evil? Where's the evil? It's right around me in the darkness. It's taunting me. The evil is there. Why would God allow me to go through evil? Because he wants to show me 
that he is greater than evil. And he's still there with me. And it says, I fear no evil. That's the key in my routine. I fear no evil. What has happened in our world today? Everybody is fearful. Why? Because the enemy is making us believe we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. It's finished. And he is saying it through media. He is saying it through newspapers. He is saying it through whatever forum will give him a platform. He is saying it. And we need to say, I fear no evil. Say it with me. I fear no evil. For thou art with, because you are with me. The reason I fear no evil is not because I'm brave. I'm not brave. I can also get scared, but I know God's with me. That's my routine that I follow. God is with me. I fear no evil. For two things God's given me quickly, I won't uh, uh, add too much. Uh, thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. Two th interesting things. God's rod speaks about a stick that you need to hit the enemy with. It's an offensive weapon. And his staff is an offensive weapon, uh, is a defensive weapon. I lean on it. So when I get tired, I say, hang on, devil. I'm just taking a breath here. I'm just leaning on God, and you just rant and rave and carry on. I'll hit you again just now. I'm just catching my breath. And then I take my rod, and I beat him up again, and I say, have you had enough? And he says, no. Then I said, okay, I'm just going to rest upon God here again. I'll catch you just now again. And he gets mad because he says, it's not fair you having a break, and then you beat me up. and you Oh, because God gave me a rod and a staff. He gave me an offensive weapon, a rod, and he gave me a defensive weapon, which is his staff. Where? Where are these weapons? While I'm walking in the valley of the shadow of death, they are with me. Why? God gave them to me. He's walking next to me and he said, use your rod. Use your staff. Now, if that's not bad news, listen to what happens now. It says, you prepare a, a table for me in the presence of my enemy. I want you to get this. This is the third point, the last one, is if walking with God is the second routine and prayer and talking to God is the first, the third one is fellowship with God. Now imagine you've just come through this tunnel of horror called the valley of the shadow of death. And you think, oh, the sun's coming out and I'm going to have a brilliant day. And in the horizons, right in your face, the enemy is waiting for you and say, come. You thought that was bad. We've got more things for you. And he's got all his weapons there. And it's all, the enemy is in my sight. God says, you see the enemy there. They've come to kill you, Jack. They've come to destroy you. Thanks for telling me, Lord. Thanks for sharing. But why are you telling me this? Because while they're doing that, God says, let's take out a table here. Put the tablecloth on. Let's put the seats out. And we're going to have fellowship, you and I now. Now, can you imagine how crazy that drives the enemy? They are trying to incite me. They want me to be fearful. They want me to run. They're getting their swords and their spears. And, and they say, you're going to die. You're never going to make it. And in the midst of that, instead of trembling, I'm having fellowship with God around a table. Can you imagine how it drives them crazy? <laughs> God's having a meal with me. While the enemy is raving, in, in the sight of the enemy, he says, I want to just tell you that Jack's with me. <laughs> and I'm with Jack. <laughs> So you keep ranting and raving. We're just going to have a meal together. Now, every time God has a meal, it's about fellowship, isn't it? So God wants to have fellowship when? Well, I'd like God to have fellowship when it suits me. Like just before work or after work or maybe, you know, when the things aren't going crazy. I, I, you know, I, when I'm ready to pray, maybe I'd say, God, have you got a bit of time now? No, God says, listen, if you walk with me, you, you have fellowship when I say so. And there's no appropriate time. It's when I know you need it. Sit down and relax. Let's have a meal. <laughs> That'll drive the enemy crazy because he wants to fight. He wants to intimidate and now I'm having fellowship with God. I, that's not fair. But you know what? Nobody said it was fair. We were never called to be fair with the devil. Don't ever try and be fair with the devil. He doesn't deserve it. We, we need to do what God's called us to do. You're prepared and you're anointed. Now, in the midst of this, quickly, I want to say, while we, God is doing this, he's having a meal with me and he's having a four-course meal, maybe a five-course meal, just to intimidate. Let's have pudding afterwards. Let's really stretch this meal because the devil's waiting now. He's waiting and the army's waiting to kill me. And God says, let's have fellowship. And then, in the midst of all this, God says, 
I want to take oil and I want to anoint your head. Do you know that that expression is a kingly expression, what they did to the kings? They anointed their heads with oil in front of the whole congregation to say, this man is now your king and he's anointed by God. So that's what God says to the enemy about me, Jack. I'm sitting there trembling and he says, no, have some more. And by the way, I'm going to anoint your oil. And then it says another quick one. It says your, your, oil, your head with oil and then it, my cup runneth over. So when, just in the midst of that, God says, let's just have, let's have a toast on your new status as the king. And he pours. And how much does he pour? Uh, just a little bit because I don't deserve much. No, half a glass because that's all he can afford. Or maybe a full glass. No, God pours until it runs over. My cup overflows. Why? He wants to show me that if I trust him and walk with him, my cup will never be empty. It will always overflow. It speaks of abundance. You know, that drives the enemy crazy. He thought he took all your resources and now God's just filling your cup again. Oh, it's so infuriating. I wanted to steal everything and now God's blessing Jack. Yes, he's blessing me and he's blessing you because he loves us. Lastly, I know this is actually my fourth point, but I'll just give an extra, it's like a bonus number. You know, I'll give you a bonus before I close. David says, surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me all the days of my life. So when I look back, what do I see? A trail of destruction. No, I see who's following me. Goodness and mercy. I think goodness and mercy is legacy. I think goodness and mercy is the blessing of God. And where are they? They are behind me. So they are trailing me. They are trail. I look behind and I see I've left in my trail mercy and goodness all the days of my life, the Bible says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. Isn't that a great promise for us this morning as we close to know that we can have a routine. And let me tell you, when you have this, you pray, you talk to God, when you, when you walk with God in step with the Spirit, when you fellowship in the midst of crisis and your cup overflows, you start to get a rhythm about you that's supernatural, that's anointed, and you start to feel empowered by God to be a king in his army and to be in charge, large and in charge. That's what God's called us to do and to be and to be a, a trailblazer for legacy so that other people can look at our lives and say, I want that for me. Can I ask you to close your eyes this morning as we pray? And I want you to not just close your eyes. I want you to not cut off now. I want you to connect with me in prayer this morning. If you're seated here or you're watching, just I, you may say, Jack, I don't know how to talk to God. I don't know how to, to walk. God. I don't know how to fellowship with God. I'd like a legacy, but how do I do it? I want to ask you this morning, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, maybe the people here, you've never prayed a prayer where you've given God authority to come and be your best friend. Maybe he has been an acquaintance and a distant cousin in your life, and maybe he knows Mary, which is married to Arthur, which is a distant cousin, and they speak about him. But I want to tell you, God wants to be your best friend and my best friend. And if he's not our best friend, I want to tell you, he needs to be. And if you want Jesus to be your best friend, pray this prayer with me. And uh, maybe you've asked Jesus to come into your life. And you know what? He may be in your life, but he may not be your best friend. I want to ask you to ask Jesus to not just come into your life, but to be your best friend. Can you pray with me? Father, as we pray this morning, I want you to pray. If you're praying behind, at home this morning or you're listening by chance to this message, God wants to speak to you. He loves you and he wants you to be his best friend. He sent Jesus Christ to die so that you don't have to have anything against you that can hold you back from God. And so, this morning, Father, as we pray, I, we ask you to come into our lives. We ask you to forgive our sins. We, we acknowledge that sometimes, Lord, we have been distant and we haven't spoken to you. We acknowledge sometimes we haven't walked in step with you. We repent of that. We acknowledge sometimes when you've said, let's sit down and have a meal. We've said, Lord, we're too busy now and things are happening and there's enemies shouting and we need to get ready for warfare. And Lord, it's not an appropriate time. Lord, we apologize.
apologize. We repent of that this morning. And so God, as we come this morning, we ask in Jesus' name, help us this morning to be your best friend. Come into our lives and speak to us by your Holy Spirit and show us your greatness. We again open our hearts to you, our time to you, and our willingness to be in rhythm with the Spirit of God. We say we choose routine and rhythm that will glorify God in our lives. And as we pray now, hear our prayers and come into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and a wonderful day. And I trust God spoke into your hearts and confirmed his word this morning.